This week, the empathy of security. The app boom is over. Wearables are a fad that's passing. Microsoft launches a VC arm and so much more. Stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. What's going on, Michael? Oh, you got the energy. <laughs> I love this. this is I told you the music was going to be worth the wait. Huh? I'm digging it. I'm digging it, too, as evidenced by my dancing. Of course, we're broadcasting live from G-Union Studios in Rhode Island. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. On the lines via Skype from the beach in South Carolina is Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. What's going on, my friend? Said, brother. Um... You know, this is an exciting time. I know a lot of people in the summertime lay back. And a lot of people are here laying back on the beaches. Um, mm. If you ever make it to Myrtle Beach, you, Paul, of course, come hang out. But anybody else, um, look me up. I, I'll try to venture out and catch up. But, uh, but I'm excited. You know, as, as we keep working on this, what I'm seeing now is this neat opportunity, right? Startups and mindset. I, I've been out talking to security leaders and other people that want more of this. They want to figure out that entrepreneurial spirit that they can apply in their organizations. And so as you and I are kind of feeling this out, this is our chance to explore the business of security, the security of business from a startup perspective, but also looking at the mindset that our colleagues need in order to be successful. So I'm pretty jazzed up. As am I. So what are we, uh, what are we, where are we going to start, Michael? Let's dig right well, in. What I thought was interesting is um, the story that says the app boom is over. You know, I feel like the startup world is pretty much the same as the security world. You, may, you need to make these bombastic statements and then try to back them up in some particular way. But, but what I wanted to do was big in, dig into it for a little bit because I found a few things that I, that I thought both made sense and didn't make sense. And I wanted to talk about that uh, both from what it means – from a startup perspective, and then what it means maybe broader from a security perspective. So the, the basic gist of it is this. Uh, apps are down. Uh, not true, right? A- app creation is up. Mm. But what they're, what they're pointing out from a trend perspective is even as the number of handsets grows, the number of people downloading new apps is decreased. And it basically said in, in any given month, the number of new apps downloaded is zero. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I ran this through my head. I think I downloaded like two or three new apps in the last month alone, some of which I paid for, so not just the freemium apps. How, how about you? I mean, are, are, is this matching your personal use and experience? Yeah, I, I think um, I have downloaded some new apps uh, in the past few days or even week, right? Like I got the Google Keep thing going on, which is an yep. app from a big company, which is kind of actually in the Google Authenticator uh, for mm-hmm. two-factor authentication, which I started using more and more, which... I find I like the security, uh, even though it's a minor inconvenience. Oh, um, I dig it. Yeah, that's there one was, of my um, There was an app that came with my Segway. So when you buy devices, typically there's an app uh, that... And that's it. one of the things that I wanted to talk about, right? So, so the yeah. other two points to this that I thought were interesting is they said this, the, the market is so saturated that if you can break through... You got a shot. But, oh, by the way, you got to be really lucky to do that. And I don't think luck has as much to do with it as we think. But then what it also talked about, and this is going to be one of those things for us to take a look at, because I hadn't paid close attention to this. So Facebook has a new app install ad business. I guess I have seen this. This is when they say recommended apps, and if you press there, it'll bring you to the app store, and, and you, can, you can download it. So what they're saying is now if, you're, if you've got an app, and you're trying to find somebody to use it, you're going to go to some other service yes. uh, to a certain extent that does it. But, but see, I, I was thinking about your segue. So it came with an app. You downloaded oh, it. The, my, probably right my, there, physical, right? my physical segue. I'm like, wait, we're segueing to something else already? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we don't mess around. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think that's one thing. I also think it's kind of interesting, not so much on the business, maybe on the business side of things, but more on the marketing side of things. A lot of people are creating apps, in my opinion, to create communities, to be interactive, to send out Mm. notifications. And I think of people who follow our shows, you know, like we have some apps that are not really community-based yet, maybe someday, um, certainly in the cigar industry, because there's so much 
pressure from the big overlords of the internet, Facebook, Google, Twitter, that may not let you promote what you're trying to promote, people are going off and creating their own app. So it really has been a commodity. I still think that if you create an app to make the world a better place, people you have to make the world a better. You have to make the world. I have started watching Silicon Valley. You're right. I'm Wait, what you'll notice in that show is that everyone who is working for a startup as a programmer either knows someone or is part of another side business that has created or is creating an app. <laughs> well, but, so, but this is the thing that I've noticed. And so, again, I'll go back to this is purely anecdotal. But the big argument for maybe the last decade or so on the development space was don't waste your time building an app because if you do, you're going to have to build one for both Android and iOS devices. And then what are you going to do when they want to go to the – just build something that's HTML5. Just make it mobile. It'll work out better. Um, I know on right, – so I'm an iOS guy. I know I have the ability that I can bookmark a page and pretend that it's an app. I, I don't do that. I, I no. much prefer the no. app experience. I agree because – well, now some people don't make their apps not as functional as their website, which is a problem. How, however, there are a lot of advantages to having an app, which is why I still think companies that create apps are still going to get funding. I still think people are going to download apps. People are going to create apps. Push notifications is huge. Access to the device to interact with the device is something that's essential to an app. You need to interact with the camera, get contacts, what have you. Interact with other applications. True Caller, for example, kind of you know plays on your phone kind of thing. Uh, to make phone calls, which our phones still make phone calls, which is amazing. That's weird, right? It's weird, right? Uh, so I, th I think apps will still be... Now, uh, uh, just to take us back to square one, apps are still software. And, and that's where exactly where I was going to bring this. Let's encourage people to create software that solves problems for people, a.k.a. make the world a better place, right? I mean, we joke about that, but... If you're solving a problem in a unique, new, and interesting way and there's a demand for it, go ahead and create your app. Don't be afraid. And don't be afraid to have an app that supplements what you're already doing. Um, yeah, I think, so you know, for me in the enterprise security space, yeah, you know, the, 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 this conversation doesn't really play in. You know, what am I going to do? Give a uh, IT security admin at a uh, hundred thousand employee company an app so they can manage security like that. You know, I, that there's no you, there's no problem I'm really solving there, right? No, you're right. There's a lower utility there, but you know what's interesting is you already talked about downloading the Google Authenticator, right? Mm -hmm. So we do see, right? I have one password on my stuff, so we we see that there are apps that are security focused that do have uh, a benefit, and some of them are then things you can access mobile. Some of them are things you can use on your desktop still. So, but th that's kind of the point that I was looking at is that if you're a startup and you're looking at these things, first of all, these types of headlines, even if you're a security-focused startup, take all of this with a grain of salt. If you're solving a problem that people are willing to pay for, mm -hmm. then you're doing the right thing, and that's good. But then don't forget about security because there's still going to be a ton of apps and the way that you protect that information or improve that experience still kind of matters, at least from my perspective. Yeah, I think the community thing is interesting uh, if startups are out there listening because I think there is a problem that we have in that space that we're so reliant on Facebook. We're so reliant on Twitter. We're so reliant on Instagram, Snapchat, what have you, that they tend to dictate the communications and the guidelines by which you communicate. Yep. And I like to see communities created that solve some of those privacy issues, some of those secure communications issues. Like when Facebook Messenger was developed, there was no SSL, um, right. it, things like that. So I, I definitely think there's opportunity, even in the security space, Michael, to securely communicate. Now there's obviously apps out there to do that. In fact, I forget the name of the one that has secure uh, chat. People are yelling out the name now in their cars as they're listening to this. I actually, yeah. I didn't put it on my new. Well, phone. there's two or three, aren't there? But like, uh, but I forget you know, to what be it was. fair, what we ding these things consistently is, you know, if you don't have deep technical experience and you're not willing to figure out some sort of a key exchange protocol, uh, they're no. This one made it easy. Okay, well then I'd love to know which one it is. Secure messaging app. What was it? What was it? I can't think of it anyway. Now, you pointed out something that I thought was interesting, and we'll start to use that as a bit of a segue to this next kind of a conversation. But, but that community angle is interesting. It's one of those things I'm looking at right now as I'm rolling out some of my stuff. Now, 
I'm focusing on communication. I'm looking more at leadership in the security space and how to help people. But, you know, it's fascinating because some folks that I work with love Facebook, totally want a, a community there. Some absolutely despise it, don't want that. Some prefer LinkedIn. Some couldn't be bothered if you wanted to. What about Slack now? What about all these other things? Mm. And, and what's interesting is, as you pointed out, not only does that create multiple channels for information, and, and few of them are actually connected together, but then I don't, I don't own that experience, right? I've got to count on somebody else to do that. So I think there's a lot of things there from a security perspective that um, I think there's some opportunities, right? <laughs> and part of, this is, part of what we're looking at is to give people that chance. This is hilarious. So the app is called Signal. And one of the uh, top comments is from someone that I know in security. The app is called Signal. And what's funny is when you install it, I think it tells people who are in your contacts list somehow that you're on it and uses it uh, by default. Because I got messages from a couple of people like, hey, you're late to the party. Welcome. You know, welcome aboard kind of thing. There goes the neighborhood. Those kind of comments. Uh, <laughs> Oh, when I installed Signal, so uh, yeah, I got to get that on my on my new phone because uh, it is from Open Whisper Systems, um, which is uh, yeah. The, They're the ones the, who do the black the phone. Yeah, no, no, different. Different Open, group. Open Whisper okay. is um, uh, what is the guy's name? Wow, I'm having a really tough time remembering things. I'm getting old, Michael. What's going on? No, when you're probably getting sleep deprived, they can't imagine why that's happening. Yeah. Well, that that too. Well, I'll tell you what. As you're getting old, uh, are, are, how do you feel about wearables? Are you you do you have one? Do you use them? Um, do you have smart watches or a Fitbit or something? I don't. I had a Samsung uh, smart watch uh, for a while. Moxie Marlin Spike, thank you, is the one of the guys behind uh, people behind Open Whisper Systems. Um, yeah, I mean wearables. I think it's a uh, it's interesting. I think there are security and privacy concerns. Yeah. With wearables, we had Rick Farina on the show last night talking about Bluetooth security, and he said he, with the technology he's been working on and developing, he knows when his mother-in-law pulls into the driveway because she has a Fitbit, and he, he knows the unique identifier for All it. All right, so I, let me just point out, you just gave me a perfect idea for a security app we should develop with Rick right now. <laughs> mm. Not notification when people <laughs> that uh, yes. you'd like to be aware of are around. And then obfuscation of our own wearable devices so people can't track us. Absolutely. And you know what? I'm kidding, and I bet that would actually sell. Yeah. Well, so here, here's the report uh, that we'll link to, but it talks about that the, the hype around wearables is fading uh, and that future devices will take new forms. And again, this is one of those, these headlines are designed, so you click them, and I get that. But when you dig into it, this is the, some of what I thought was interesting. It, it said that the big change it's expecting is that more of these devices will be uh, standalone and or incorporate. They'll, they'll be almost like uh, communication hubs as opposed to being dependent only on your smartphone. So your smartwatch today predominantly needs your smartphone. These other devices can do things, but they need to connect to something else. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you um, – I don't wear watches, but I was starting to look for if somebody did like a smart pocket watch, I'd actually consider it. I think that's kind of interesting. But then at the same time, what I looked at, and this is the part that made it most interesting to me, is if these wearable devices or communications devices and they become hubs for just about everything else that we've got, the security and privacy considerations of that feel to me like it just exploded relative to what it was. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I completely agree. Um, so, what do we do? What do we do about that? I, well, I, you know, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword because it can be used to improve security. Uh, there have been, I mean, ever since the beginning of time when we first did the show, I remember one of the guys on our show was experimenting with, um, he had Bluetooth on his phone, and when he got near his laptop, his laptop automatically unlocked. Yep. And this was like 11 years ago. He was messing around with that technology on Linux. And so I, I think there's interesting security implications. But as we were discussing with Rick last night, and as I've researched as well, the different implementations of wireless protocols like that, and this goes for Zigbee and, uh, as well, um, the underlying protocol only provides so much. And then it depends on what you build on top of it. So the security of these devices varies greatly. So in that respect, Michael, I think there is opportunity to develop a secure solution. I'm curious to get your take on the companies like Open Whisper Systems and Blackphone um, that are developing 
applications for the security conscious people. Do you think that's a viable market? Do you think that's going to expand moving into the future given where technology is going? Yes and yes, and here's why. I think it's a niche market. And one of the things that you look at, and one of the, the points in this article in specific was, you know, you got the early adopters, they buy it, that mm -hmm. validates the market, right. and then the next thing that has to happen is the market shifts. And when the market shifts, it drops the prices, it commoditizes it to a certain extent. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet where security's gotten commoditized. We still kind of prize it as this, right. this precious little niche thing over here. So, you know, I mean, I, I look at it. I, for my business, I still prize interoperability, right? I, I'm fascinated with the black phones. I'm fascinated with a lot yeah. of these things. But, you know, I'm still going to choose interoperability and convenience and, and the ability to still play some of the games I like or, or whatever it's it some is. Some of it's just laziness. I can go into Best Buy, get my Google Nexus yeah. Huawei 6P phone. Um, for black phone, you know, there might be a waiting list. I got to order it, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And then I got yeah, to order my and provider. So, I so that's get good in the short system. run. Yeah. I think, and, and this is the part that, that I, I, and I'd love if somebody's got an idea on this or somebody's working this, and this is the type of stuff I'd, we'd love to know more about. The question then is, how do you provide that service that people are willing to pay for that kind of benefits everybody? So are you, do you need to be an app? I mean, even though we just said apps are done, I mean, do, will security apps start to, to play a role in this? Uh, or is it that we need to incorporate some sort of a security design into it? I mean, look, for years, Intel was brilliant, right? Powered by Intel. Uh, and then AMD uh, caught up into it, and they did those arguments. I mean, do we want to have competing security frameworks that, that people can adopt and start to use in these devices? You know, and as Jock pointed out last night, the challenge to it is these devices, as powerful as they are, for as small as they are, are they're still very constrained. And that forces people into, into decisions. I, I don't. I don't see. Well, a lot yeah, because they're going to go. They're going to go with the chip that's cheaper, Michael, not the chip that has security features. Right. I, it's just the way economics. And they want it to work, right? And yeah. they want it to work faster. And so, if right. if I give you something and I can offer you security in it, but that means it's maybe not going to connect to everything on the first try, and you're yeah. maybe not going to like the experience. Speed, and you got to go through five extra steps. Performance, reliability. Um, and cost will yeah. trump security when you're trying to make hundreds of thousands of a particular device. I, I mean, especially when you get to scale, right? That's why we see all these crummy little routers and wireless routers that are so cheap because they want to make a ton of them. So if they can save a dollar on every chip, I mean, the Linksys W54G distribution was like right. something ridiculous, like 50,000 I think there's, aren't they still month. more or less selling them or the variant of yeah, them still? Yeah, and there's, and there's like and million, there are millions of them. Yeah. So sure. if you're saving a dollar or two a device here or there, that's a huge savings for the company. So unfortunately, those things are going to trump security. Everywhere. Well, and so, and so let's stand this for a second. So one of the things that, that we've looked at at the outset of this program is that there's always different personas. And, and so one is, okay, there's those of us in the startup community. And, and I think it's fair to say for some of this is you look at it and you say, so what you're saying is security doesn't matter. That's not what we're saying. No. What we're acknowledging is it, we have some distance to grow as an industry. And here's where it's going to start to matter then. As a buyer, doesn't matter to me whether it's business to business or business to consumer, if you're a business-oriented buyer, this is where you get to start to ask some of those questions. So you want that entrepreneurial mindset in your, in your group or you're one of those leaders and you're looking at these types of things, at least start asking the questions. And what that's going to do in your organization is you're going to have to get a chance to work with legal and find a way that you guys both have a mutual understanding. You're going to have to go work with procurement, make sure they have an understanding. You're going to have to talk with the other businesses. And, and what I've started to notice is a lot of people in security will say, well, I mean, that's bad. Okay, why? Well, someone could get your information. Yeah. okay, why? We've got to go come up with the better examples of realistic things that could happen that don't jeopardize our authenticity or the authority that we have to talk about them, where people go, oh, okay, well, I guess it's worth asking for, right? And I think that's the difference is, I, I wouldn't recommend that you demand it. It's, it's another factor to start to consider. Get people comfortable asking those questions because I can tell you right now, and you and I both know a number of security startups that when the customer asks you, well, how do you do this or how do you protect this? You, you go back and look at that, and if you get asked that enough, it becomes something we go, okay, people are asking, they care. I think the same thing happens on the consumer side. It's just going to take a little longer, and it's going to be a different 
direction. But it's the same thing. We can't keep doing like we've done, for example, with passwords. Choose a hard-to-guess password. It must be complex, blah, 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 blah. All this dogma that we don't really understand. We've never really explained it. People don't really get it. And so we go, oh, well, passwords didn't work. Mm. None of that's accurate. So, so what I look at here then is, is that if you're the buyer, you actually have a remarkable amount of power to start to shift the conversation. Same thing if you're an investor. Just ask the questions. Look, you can still decide that this is a good investment for you because in the short run, no one's really going to do anything anyway, and, and you're good to go. But there's going to come a point where you're going to have to know better, and I'm pretty confident that the investors who can start asking these questions now and learning through the investments that they currently have, they're going to be the more savvy investors the next three to five years, and that's where it's going to pay off. Yeah, it's an interesting question of economics, and I, I think it levels out over time. If you look at the watch example, Apple's going to develop a watch based on iOS, which already benefits from some pretty good security mm -hmm. in that operating system. Now, there have been issues, but they've been addressed, and there's been drama. But for the most part, uh, the iOS that they've built is, has a really good security model. If you're a startup, it's going to be really hard to have any level of distribution that provides the same level of security for a, a much weaker investment to get into the market. So does that mean the consumer is faced with buy the more expensive thing which benefits from security or buy the uh, more expensive thing or by the less expensive thing that may not have all the security things but has more of the features that you want? Or is it flipped or does it depend on the situation? Well, no, I, I think, I, again, so when we look at this from a business perspective, how much did a standard SSL cert cost us five years ago? How much did it cost 10 years ago? Now you can get them for free. And, and to be fair, that was largely driven by Google to a certain extent. Um, and, and so what I am starting to notice, and in, in if we look at what Apple's doing, go ahead and question their motives all you want, but to your point, they're building good security hardware, and they're matching that with pretty good security software, and they're starting to make it pretty easy. I mean, Apple's yeah. known for their usability. So I actually think it's happening and, and that what we need are some of these bigger companies to show how it works. Price, so is still, price is still high when Apple enters the market typically, but that tends to fall out over time. Now with the Just phone, like we're talking about with these wearables. Yeah, but with the phone, they can subsidize that cost with the carriers and I think that's why everyone can go out and get an iPhone. Well, you, you notice that all the, all the carriers just basically stopped that. Oh, the really? Well, most of them stopped it, um, at least as, as, uh, as important, be because now we're trying to be more interoperable with everything, mm -hmm. and we're finding people aren't buying as many phones as often. And, and, and by the way, that's why Apple got into that marketplace. Swing it back then. If you're a security company today, and you've got something on this, that's probably going to be your path. Your path is probably creating this and creating something that solves a pretty interesting problem cleverly mm -hmm. that an Apple or a Google or a Microsoft or somebody are going to buy. So let's, let's use that as a shift point, right? So there's a, a pretty cool article uh, talking about how this is the sector. Security is a sector that's ripe for mergers and acquisitions. And it talked about the big stuff. Uh, Semantic bought uh, Blue Coat. Mm -hmm. uh, Vista Equity Partners is going to buy Ping Identity. That's mm -hmm. actually, I think, a big. Uh, Cisco just bought CloudLock. Mm -hmm. I got an update yesterday. Dumbala just got snatched up. They were a smaller player. But uh, if you look at what they got, I mean, they got picked up for pennies on the dollar. And here's what's interesting. There are two things I pulled out of this that I thought were really kind of fascinating. The first of which is it, it identified and it said, look, this is an industry where there's a lot of attention fast. And so we're going to keep following this through. There's a lot of attention fast. And a lot of the solutions right now are still very niche. They're very technical. They're very focused on solving a specific problem. That's what makes them ripe for mergers and acquisition. But the corollary that comes with that is, yes, I can solve that problem, kind of, but that's going to put a big workload on your security team. And what we're starting to see now is there's a backlash from that. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it, they're absolutely right. I mean, this is a, a market that is ripe for acquisitions. What I believe is playing into that is that operational IT and security merging together, as we talked about on, on last night's show, Yep. I still think that we're probably five or ten years away from that being a true reality. And I hope that five years from now, security can shed some of those responsibilities off to operations. You and me both. 
because yeah. some of that security uh, intelligence, for lack of a better term, and not in the product sense, but in the concept of security intelligence, we built into the administrators and developers' tools that they're using, which, I, and I think that's why you're seeing a lot of uh, these acquisitions, like Cisco buying CloudLock, right? Cisco wants to have people embrace the cloud, but some of those people have some security concerns, so when you're Cisco, you go buy a cloud security company, and you just integrate right. that into the entire fold. Whereas That's right, and, and, and so what's nice about this, too, that I see then, is that we get those opportunities, right? So again, so if you're a startup today, go build your solution, be really good with it, but then be mindful of this secondary part. The reason that people are getting upset in the marketplace and part of what fuels some of these acquisitions, right? So you're either that bright star and you're on the upswing and one of these big companies comes in and they pluck you when they can get you for a good price yep. and everybody's happy and that's awesome. But the other thing we're seeing this talks about is that there are underperforming companies and that's kind of why I brought up Dumbala. I, I, look, I, what is I've, Dumbala? So I've worked with Dumbala in the past. Mm -hmm. I, let me just explain it the way that I've always best understood it. What they always said was, uh, prevention is awesome, but what you need is is rapid detection and confident response. And so what they would talk about is we don't give you an alert. We, we give you, um, I forgot what they call it, but basically because of their ability to read so much DNS and, and all of their machine learning that they had for like the last decade, if they said to you, you need to go pay attention to this device, you, you needed to go pay attention to that device. Their false positives were exceptionally low and that meant then that your team could go focus on just the stuff they needed to focus on. Now, this will this will fall into what we're going to talk about later. And in in full disclosure, I have worked with Dumbala in the past. They captured me uh, in terms of their ability to do some of this type of stuff. I think they struggled to tell a good story consistently. Mm -hmm. They they got locked up in well, we're APT prevention. Yeah, stop. Everybody says that, right? Mm -hmm. What 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 I saw them do was something that's unique. So guess what? Their stock, uh, you know, their, their valuation was getting struggling. So somebody buys them, comes in, and this is what the second part of the article talks about. It says, you're going to start to see these companies that are underperforming, and also listed FireEye as an example, mm -hmm. are going to get bought out by uh, venture capital, and they're going to bring in a new team, and they're going to fix up the issues. They're going to clean up the tech. They're going to clean up the story to it. They're going to reintroduce it into the marketplace, reinvigorate it, and then they're going to IPO it again. Hmm. That's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's an. I've never really. We haven't covered anything like that. Yeah. It's a secondary. I mean, it's, it's yeah. essentially a secondary market's coming out of it. And you know, and you and I gave up the secret last week about Owler and and working with the, the people. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, and looking at that type of stuff. I'm starting to see a lot of new VC firms move into the space, which then comes back to it. When I look at this, if you're a VC looking at something or you're a startup doing something, this is the biggest challenge that I see today. Yeah, it kind of means you can suck at your marketing message and still get bought. <laughs> well, you can. The question is, are you going to get bought for what you're worth, right? right. So, yeah, so, your value is going to be much less. I agree. I agree. I mean, Dumbala took in, I don't know, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but they took in some $50 million in funding and they got bought up for, I think it was uh, $9 million. Oh, uh, well, uh, yeah. Okay, well, so that's seriously not, devalued. That's, not, yeah. that's, that's pennies on the dollar. Right. And, and that's, by the way, kind of what... what if you have a good tech, but a yeah. poor message and an inability to execute, you, you'll get bought um, mm -hmm. and you're going to have some pretty cool lessons and some stories to talk about. Here's the thing, though, uh, that I think is going to start to become important. If your solution creates more work for people, you're not going to be as successful as those solutions that make it easier for the teams to do what they want. We're going to keep having the conversation about whether we actually have a shortage of people in security or not. I'm on the side that says, not really. I accept local shortages. I accept uh, there's, a, there's some, in fact, what it really is for me is it's a market inefficiency. We don't know what we're looking for. We don't know how to identify it. We don't know how to discuss it. There's a lot of those pieces that come together, and we've got to figure, figure that out better. If your solution, however, just dumps more work on the team that's currently there, that doesn't help. So what I predict and, and this is going to work whether you're the buyer, right? So if you're a buyer, you've got to be asking those questions and assessing that impact. If you're an investor, you've got to do the same thing because if you're going to invest in a security company, you need to make sure that their tech is good, but you need to make sure that their marketing is good and that the experience of using that tool makes that team better and increases their capabilities. If it doesn't do that, then the likelihood is it will be devalued in the future and someone else is going to buy it, come in, fix it, and you know, roll it into their solution or whatnot. 
And I think that's what you're going to start to see. Where I think this is good, I'm seeing more and more platform-oriented uh, uh, approaches. In fact, I, this is to me the, the forcing function of the cloud. The, the, right, if you're in the cloud today, you've got to figure out how to integrate with everybody. So we're mm-hmm. back to the days of APIs. We're back to the days of middleware, right? That's what Zapier is. It's all middleware. So what we're doing now is we're looking at ways that I can integrate all these things together. And that goes back to your other point. I want to start to see the security companies that come out and say, we make the security team better. Oh, and also the ops team. Well, and also the dev team. Yeah. yeah. I don't need to buy seven different solutions or seven different tools. Uh, here's a tool, and it's going to meet the needs of all these teams. Mm-hmm. We can do the governance we want on it. And so, so the point is, yeah, we're going to see a lot of M&A. I think there's going to be some churn. There's going to be some secondary churn. And the people that, quote, win on this are going to be the ones that start listening to the things you and I are talking about. Make it easier for people to do their jobs. Make it easier to push security out to the edges and give those people the control that they want to do the things that they need and, and inform the security teams what they want. Oh, I, I agree. I think if you can show value in all of those areas that you mentioned, in security, in operations, development, that's, that's a hard one to cross over into. But certainly in operations and security, uh, you're on the right track and you're going to get funding you're going to get bought. You're going to IP. You're going to. You're on the fast track. You know. Well, and so to that end, uh, the other story, and I thought this was interesting. Microsoft launched the VCR. Hey, now, that was that was a segue. Ha <laughs> ha! I liked it. <laughs> they they've got their VCR now. They already have accelerators. They've already made investments before. What's different about this? And and I pulled out one thing that I thought was most fascinating about it was this is how they can keep their finger on the pulse. I I didn't um, grab who made the quote exactly, um, but it, it's. This is, a, this is a pulse move, and I think that's – I think sometimes people don't always realize that. Some of these bigger companies, when they make these investments and they're doing this, it's because they want to hear the pitches. They want to see what people are working on. They, this is the simplest, best way to keep their finger on the pulse of what's going on, and if they see something that they know fits into their larger strategic initiatives, boom, they're going to grab it. I think that means – tell me your take on it. I think that means that if you're in one of these startups and you're doing security stuff – and you get a chance to go pitch these things, I think you should do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you never turn down an opportunity to pitch. Which means you got to be practiced on how to pitch. But So here's the other part that I thought was interesting, and it, and it was neat because of the way we were reading it. So it says, okay, they're going to launch in the Bay Area, Seattle, New York City, and Tel Aviv. Instantly in my head I went, okay, there's a security focus there. Yep. And, uh, and then it says, you know, uh, oh, and, and the guy running it, who used to run the Qualcomm Venture uh, Group, says, uh, oh, yeah, uh, we're going to go focus cloud services, machine learning, and security. So that means if you have a cloud security machine learning service, you're right you're that, for the you picking. Call, yeah. Yeah. Call, call them up right now. They want to yeah. invest it's, in you. <laughs> get, get, that, get that pitch on. Get it going. But see, again, what I think is interesting about this is that there's a there's, – so what we've talked about so far today – uh, that you know, if, if we start looking at some of these trends, is that the app boom is over, except for not really. The wearables thing is changing, except for not really. But what we are seeing in security is there's going to be a lot of mergers and acquisitions. Oh, but there's still a lot of an investment into it. But what we're looking at there is you've got to make it better. They're in, going to invest in security, but it's got to be better, right? It's, it's the empathetic side of things. You've got to make it better for the people who are buying it. It's, it's either got to work because you're going to make the wearables better and more secure, uh, or because uh, you're going to help stitch it all together a bit better. And we're going to watch the, the, the private equity money come in and the institutional money come in, but the big, the big guys, they're still going to come into it too, because it's, it's just as good for them. In fact, it's sometimes better for them in terms of advancing their products. I take that on whole as a positive. If you're a security startup today and you know how to deal with one of these issues, you've got a lot of options. There's a lot of angles in which you can go, and it's not always about going public. Sometimes it's about getting sold. Sometimes right. it's about getting licensed. Sometimes it's about folding in, and, and I think that there's a lot of options there. But the, which, I, I like the, the empathy piece to this, Michael, because it ties into all our previous stories right, that we were talking about and as to how you want to solve problems with your startup, uh, especially in security as these markets get more and more flooded apps, wearables, security in and of itself, right, is, a, is a getting flooded with startups as well. Um, you have to have that empathy piece. And it's interesting, we can't go through an episode without talking about Shark Tank. The ones, <laughs> but the pitches that have 
empathy towards a problem or group of people, and it's a large enough group of people, um, or even the right group of people, those are the ones that get funding. It's much more difficult, I think, for, I just think of the guy that, you know those red solo cups that everyone drinks out of when they're in, Absolutely. in college? He said, well, you know, I saw all these cups, and there was so much waste, so he created one that was a shot glass on the inside. So you could flip it over, and it was a shot glass. And he thought that was like empathy and solving a problem. I guess for some it is. I for some, that's a, that's a problem. Yeah, exactly. He did end up getting, uh, getting a deal, but I, you know, I think it's, there's much better stories out there that I think you can model your own pitches around and model your own solutions around and your messaging around. Um, what are, and you know what? Th there's something that you said there I want to really push up for people. Don't have to recreate the wheel. You can go model what other people have done. You and I have shared stuff uh, that, we've, that we've watched Elon Musk do. I yeah. think there's others that do well. But they're telling you stories. You know, the big challenge that we see, and this is the last story that, that, we'll, uh, that, that we'll put up for people, but it talks about the best pitches are empathetic, not egotistic. And the point is, it's not really about you. And, and, and what I'll add to that is when you're doing a startup, it's not about you except for it's all about you. It's your energy, it's mm -hmm. your vision, it's your drive, it's your reputation. Except for it's not, right? I mean, it's all <laughs> yeah. of those things, yeah. but, but it's that's not, not yeah. really what people are buying, right? right. It's kind of like you go back to it. There are a group of people who if they need to buy a new drill, they get excited about the, what kind of battery it takes mm -hmm. and what kind of drive it has and reputation and everything else. Most people... They need a hole in the wall or they need, to, they need to do whatever, you know, screw a bunch of stuff in with the drill. They just want a drill. But they don't want the drill, right? They want the result of the drill. Yeah, yeah. We get lost in security. And a lot of people do this too. Tech, security. We're so excited about the features. We're so excited about, but look, I can do this widget and you can turn these dials and look at how awesome it is that we forget to go back to, right, what's the problem we're trying to solve mm -hmm. and the emotional side of that problem. If you state a perfunctory, you know, this, this article said something in it that I really liked, and I'll point out a couple other things too. But somewhere in there, and I'm going to use my words, if you talk to some of these tech founders, and I'm, I mean some of the giants, and they go to tell you their story, it's just a resume. Yeah. Well, I worked here for five years, and I worked here, then I worked here, then I started this company, and we took off. Right. No. What's that's the, not, that's not a story. What's the story around why you wanted to solve that problem that you're solving? Did you eat ramen noodles? Did, did, you, yeah. did you ride on the bus? Did you, you know, I mean, Silicon Valley, did you ride the company bus? Did you wear the company hoodie? Mm. Uh, and, and some of them, it was before startups. But what was that like? What did you invest into? it? You see the Shark Tank guys ask this all the time. Yeah. What have you put into it? How, how much money, how much blood, sweat, and tears? How committed are you to this? And I think those things are kind of interesting. The other part that this points out is that uh, go ahead and use constraints. So one of the people was talking about, Forcing them into, you know, you've got 30 seconds to explain this, go. And then working with them iteratively until they get that down. I work with a lot of people who don't like constraints. They say, oh, that's, I can't do constraints. Constraints are your friend. Constraints unleash your creativity. And if you use the right structure, it reveals your substance. So don't be afraid to use the constraints. Don't be afraid to go look at what somebody else said and go, okay, they got that knocked out in this period of time. All right, I'm going to do the same thing. But, but that's, it's, it's empathy, right? So it's empathy in the pitch. It's empathy in your solution. It's empathy in the way that you approach the marketplace. Empathy is kind of the killer app at the moment. It, it's the big buzzword in, in leadership today. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, those of you that do music or photography or are in the arts in any way, uh, or you've got kids that are doing this, encourage your kids. Uh, yeah, you want them to learn to code and do everything else. Arts. Arts are the empathy. And the, the schools that emphasize the arts are the ones that are going to create the kids that do best at this uh, in the next decade. Michael, you've got some updates. Uh, you're giving away your uh, leadership uh, framework, correct? Yeah. The, the thing that was kind of interesting about it, because, you know, we talk about what this is like for us uh, as startups and, and kind of going through it all was I kind of had that moment. And I think I mentioned this on the last show where I separated out what I'm working on uh, into the framework which I'm happy to give away. I can't help everybody. And I'm going to give that away. And then I'm going to create some programs. And in fact, you, you talk about the empathy and talking to people and figuring it out. I had some designs in my head for how it was going to work. And the way that I'm doing it now is I'm, uh, I'm about to launch. So by the time this airs, I will have already launched a, a short tactical executive course. And then that will pave way to whatever comes next. But that's matching up now to what the in-person experience is like. So you, know, you and I talk a lot. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, some people like the cloud. Some people still want that, that on-premise. Well, you know, it's the same thing. Some people are going to want to work with me face-to-face, and some are going to want to be able to, to do it online. And what I'm trying to do is give them both. It, but also so that if you work with me face-to-face, you can have that online. So it's been interesting because all, all the stuff that we talked about here fits. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of what I'm, I'm tailoring in when I started, I was really excited about the feature, right? It's five questions. It's three rounds. It's, it's the, no, now I'm, I'm really looking at what if I could show you how to solve your security problems and elevate your leadership? Mm. What if I could show you how to bring people together and give them a voice without wasting their time? Those are the things that have come out of moving quicker, and taking some risks and getting a little scared, but talking to people and figuring out how to adapt. And uh, I, I think that there's a lot of lessons there uh, uh, for the folks uh, that are trying, that are in the same boat. How about you? What are you working on? Uh, Black Hat is my shirt is coming up. Uh, so we've got demo of our software, offensivecountermeasures.com. If you're so. interested, uh, we got demo and hopefully shipping product uh, in a trial version uh, very soon. So it's very exciting. Uh, it's it's a, it's a balance in my day, right? Bells and whistles, guiding the UI developers into what I think security people want to see in the product because they're all about you know bells and whistles, but also working on the other side too, thinking about what problems we solve and constantly developing our pitch. Well, and keep in mind as you're doing that, and you and I can continue to work on this even off off the show, but is that, yeah, so, so what's interesting about your situation is you've got to go show the bells and whistles to the security person yeah. who wants that, but they have to then go back to whoever else is going to sign the PO yeah. and get excited about whatever the business problem that they're solving is. That's, why, that that's why Black Hat frightens me because everyone's going to be in that audience, and there's got to, I'm going to come up with some like indicators as to where to go with the pitch when you're talking about the product, who are you talking to, uh, because that's going to matter. But also enabling those technical people to not get the bells and the whistles, but also get the, the problem that you're solving. Yep. So that's the stuff we're going to keep talking about. So. That's it. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> all righty. We'll visit startup.securityweekly.com for all of the latest episodes of Startup Security Weekly. Thanks, everyone, for watching. 